validation, the ability to validate that some piece of data correspond to a schema. So that's something that we don't have. On the other hand, I think there is a ph philosophical concern with types and it's what's exactly the relationship between a piece of data and a type. And I think it's very uh, I know, arrogant to pretend that my, the type is inherent to the data. I think it's more humble to say, I have a function that receives a map and the function expects some fields to be present in the map in order to work correctly. That's the approach that we take in dynamically, in gradual typing, dynamically typed language. Uh, and from what I understand in a statically typed language, we say, no, it's not a piece of data that corresponds to a schema. It's a piece of data that is of a certain type. Um, and that, that's the question I'd like to, to address. What do you guys think? What, what should be exactly the, what is the proper relationship? Even philosophically, before going into something pragmatic and how fun or how, or how fast it is to discover what are the expected fields. But let's say philosophically, what, what, what are the relationship between type or schema and data? So worth noting, just a quick factual note, um, you can absolutely say what you just said uh, in Elm. You can say like, for example, I, this argument to this function is a record. It has to have at least these fields of these types, but it can have whatever else you want in there. Um, yes, but, but no, but this is not what I'm talking about because even then you would say this argument is of a, re if, is, is of a record type, of a specific record type uh, with a name, it's of record type A. And if you have two different record types with the same fields. Oh, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. <laughs> let's say, okay, let's say I have a, my function expect to receive a map with the field A and B. Yes. One way to express that is to create a type named uh, foo that has field A and B and whatever other fields. But let's say I have another type that is called bar and that is as the exact same definition of as foo. Will my function works when it receives bar or it works when, only when it receives foo? You can do or that. Do I need an yeah. Yeah. So, or, it's, it's structural types. It's, you don't have to name them. You can, you yeah, can or, or, or duct typing. Right, D duct typing is a feature of, of type systems that can do that. I mean, so one of the points I would make, and this gets back to some of the prototyping discussion and, and areas where you wouldn't want the, the type system. Um, if you have a, a, an experienced programmer who can keep the entire program in their head, and this is exactly a prototyping scenario, you can be successful any number of ways. But it's an interesting thought exercise of all the, to enumerate the context that they have that's enabling them to move that fast. And if you take that same person on the same code base and you separate them by two years, you'll find that their, their velocity drops significantly. And, and this is part of what type systems are doing is type systems are codifying um, this data model of the application, that, that making it explicit, which is otherwise implicit, and is providing documentation, which would otherwise have to exist somewhere and have to be maintained. But in, in a type system, your data model is explicitly I think that in that documented. Is, and I think that in, in, with that aspect, I think even a dynamically typed language like Clojure agree we need a way to, to make uh, the schema explicit and not rely only on documentation. The question is, what is the proper way? Is it typing or is it having a schema and somehow specify I, that I expect this piece of data to be, uh, to conform to a schema? I think, I think, we, have, I think I, I, yeah. we have uh, talked about it in the very beginning. I think uh, about, it. I think Richard uh, put it beautifully into, the when do you check the type right you have the assembly language you have the four times that were you have four, four points four points in time when you check the typing right so and i think uh, the question is uh, not should you but uh, more, more like when should you do this right at, at some point we should check it anyway right so whether it's at the age of your application or the compile time or somewhere else or by visual inspecting it right but uh, and I know we have we'll have a lot to say about it, but I just want to come back to the prototyping and then we can you know jump back here. So I think uh, it, what's interesting, Richard, you said that I don't want to uh, you know run my program and figure out uh, that it's wrong. I want the compiler to tell me that it's wrong before I run my program. Uh, that's one thing you said, and the, the other thing you said is that um, 
in Rock, I think you're building a capability of uh, of actually um, of actually making people to run partial or partial code, right? Regardless of the type, you can you can extract certain a part of a, of a code, whether it's a function, a sub function, or a body inside the function, sub body inside the function, and, and run it, right? I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but, uh, it, but it's uh, it's more just like it feels like a dynamic language, like or that's the goal. No, no, like, I, I, I run get it, it yeah. and it runs until it either crashes or, or doesn't. <laughs> I, I, I get it, but I, I think those two concepts are interesting to to kind of put together and say. I would say that uh, you know, last years of my professional development is definitely more closure driven. You know, I tried uh, and, and uh, worked a little bit in different languages, of course, in Scala and Rust and of course, Java and all other languages, but uh, uh, in closure specifically, and I'm not saying that closure is be all and on all of dynamic languages. I'm just saying that this is more, uh, this is the primary experience that I have with dynamic languages, uh, probably Python and closure. Uh, I do not need to run a program to, under, to understand whether it's right or wrong. Because I never, I very rarely work with the program as a whole. Like I, most of the time I work with the very, very zoomed in part of the program that by the way, I can, I work most of it in, in REPL. Uh, and, and by the way, of that part of the feature of the part of the feature that I zoom in, I break it down even to the smaller parts in REPL and play with them as well. So it's, it's, it's an interesting effect of it's uh, probably uh, you have to, try to believe it, right? And I'm sure that most of us, if not all, already tried it. But uh, uh, when you when you do so this, you know, I, I don't like this definitions, but we do this REPL making, REPL based development, right? You get to test as you, you know, I'm not saying that you shouldn't need, we don't need test after that. I'm just saying that you already get to test for those little things that uh, Richard, you mentioned that, you know, those stupid errors that I make in the code, I, I want compiler to tell me right away. So I, I think that uh, there's no, you know, win or lose, there's no benefits or disadvantages in both you know, typed or untyped in this because in untyped language in the diamond such as closure and the other REPL driven uh, languages, you, you have this as well because you touch every little bit piece of code and you try it with different types of uh, you know data integration so this this replicability uh, it's uh, you know we're, we're software developers right so we're the creators of the new and you cannot really uh, you know REPL is like super REPL is like exactly what, are, what, what what when you when you're building a sculpture right you don't you don't start of uh, you know building a nose and check if it's a nose you know building a hand and check if it's a hand and build a second hand and check if it matches, right? You're just building a sculpture the way you see it, right? And uh, the, the beautiful sculpture, sculpture is most likely will uh, end up, uh, you know, end up being created from a person who creates it the way they, they see it right away and little by little, definitely making mistakes, you know, scratching, scruffing things here and there. But this is probably what uh, this prototype in question, going back to prototype, I think it's super Not important. Totally. Do you think realize, that... Uh, that the, this REPL actually makes makes kind of compensates for that uh, for that compiler instant uh, uh, feedback. Yeah, sorry. I think that it's it's inherently uh, impossible to have a closure like REPL in a statically typed language. Oh, it's very possible. And by the way, like from Java nine, for example, and uh, I'm not picking on Java. I think I actually think that. Uh, you know, study, I'm, I'm, as, as Richard mentioned, we can, you know, go to the, go to the, uh, I can defend static typing or dynamic typing because they both have, uh, you know, depending what we're talking about and what problem we're solving, they both have a uh, place in the world. But at, from Java 9, right, uh, you have, you have J shell, they call it, right? In yeah, Scala, yeah. Scala, you have REPL since, since like way, way, way back on, right? So, but if you work with this REPL, like I, I really like, uh, the, when Java 9 added the type inference, the first kind of iteration of type, type inference, uh, they added REPL as well. I think it's not a, not a coincidence, right? So you can actually, uh, it gives you, you know, the references for the variables as you do, as you do things in the REPL. The problem is that uh, uh, another problem, of course, we're probably going to go to like functional versus object oriented, but in dynamic type languages, uh, you focus more on the data. And, and uh, the, when you look, when you're thinking about the problem, you're thinking about points in time, which are could be functions and data traveling through these points in time. That's what you're focusing on, right? Because because all you have is a function that gets data, right? And you kind of give data to the next function in next in a different point in time, right? It's called the epoch, epochal time uh, model, I think. So uh, in uh, when you have types, when you do in, in REPL in Java or Scala, you kind of don't have that capability just because. Uh, 
you you're constrained as uh, you know as we talked about you, you you cannot take a part of the program take data from here and then pass it to the, the other part of the program because you need to run it as a whole right and that's where a compiler is kind of super useful because in order for you to run as a whole or a module as a whole you need to know that it's actually going to run it becomes less useful if you actually able to disassemble the program and uh, work with this little parts of the program i think it's a uh, kind of the these pieces work together um, uh, between the you know, if, if in the dynamic type, 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 type language or static type language. So Elm has a REPL and what I find myself using it for most often is, I mean, I definitely do use it in that way of like breaking something down into like a, a small piece, like only one function at a time, or maybe like one function that calls another function or something. But almost always when I'm using it in that way, it's because uh, the calculations are hard. Like the types are not, they're just trivial. It's like, everything's a number, but like, I have to like multiply this by that, or, you know, do a bunch of like geometry or something like that. Or like, um, whatever, there's a bunch of calculations and, uh, and I'm trying to, you know, experiment with it and try to figure out like what, what's going to give me the right answer. Um, but when I don't do that, like when I'm not doing a calculation or something, I just have a revealed preference. Like, even though I could do that workflow all the time, I have a revealed preference for just like, modifying the whole bigger program and just not really thinking about zooming in and zooming out, just stay at one zoom level and just let the compiler tell me about whatever mistakes I made, you know, at whatever level I was looking at. So I have found empirically that that's at least for me faster than doing everything in the REPL, but I, I certainly appreciate that. Like, I mean, if I were to do a stack ranking of like my favorite languages, like if someone was like, you have to pick, you have to choose your, your next job is going to be either in Java or closure. I would pick closure. <laughs> um, uh, I, I mean, I've, I've done Java professionally. I haven't done Clojure professionally. So maybe that's, you know, just me having like a, a, a good impression um, that would maybe be different when I actually tried it. But um, but I think the tooling is, is hugely different. And like static versus dynamic is only one way to compare programming language. There's a lot of other factors to it. And I think it's, it's, it's pretty far down the list. I mean, immutability by default, I think, is is really high in terms of enabling the things we're talking about. And then, you know, pure functions as a, as a, a primary um, item that you're, you're kind of an atom in your, your system. Um, once you have those two things, I, I, I care very little about the rest, I'd say. Uh, <laughs> that, that kind of enables all, all of the things that we're talking about as benefits uh, in our experiences. Um, those are really the fundamental parts more so than, than types versus, versus uh, dynamic types. And you have a lot of flexibility um, in, in what your implementation can do when you have those as your primary building blocks. And I just wanted to confirm that uh, this is probably you guys talking about closure because closure has immutability by default. And uh, yeah, no, I love it. I, I, just just for, for, our, for our listeners, I just want to confirm. I'm not, saying that, I'm not saying that closure is all be all uh, language, but this is this is definitely a very good point the concurrency and immutability, reasoning, reasoning about the runtime, right? It's something the immutability gives you that. And uh, this is definitely uh, kind of very much related to the quality that we're trying to build, whether we check the quality at compile time. And, and if you use Java, make every member final. If you use TypeScript, make every data member read only. If you do those things in the very beginning, you're going to find everything else becomes much easier. I mean, you have to, you have to get some, some brain mechanics to understand how to work efficiently with structures that can't be changed. Um, but once you get that understanding, it's, it's uh, pretty straightforward. Yeah, I would say in, in Java specifically, uh, one of, it's one of my favorite you know, interview questions. So uh, final will not help you with uh, most of the things immutable because your list can be final, but the thing inside the list won't be. But no, it's, it's, a, good, it's a good point though. So in, in, in Java and, and, uh, and, and beginning of Scala, so Scala used to have like immutable versus immutable collections. In, in Java, for example, before, you know, even Scala was in the picture, we had some that like a builder pattern or always create, have no setters, always create, it through, create the objects through constructor, uh, and uh, so this is the, this is definitely a very important uh, feature of a language that's orthogonal, whether it's uh, you know statically typed or dynamically typed. I agree with you, Martin. So Martin. one thing I want to, since you know we're to be cognizant of the time, we have to talk about the elephant in the room: uh, TypeScript. You know, a number of years ago, the Microsoft uh, came, well, some people came up with TypeScript, Microsoft kind of picked it up. Uh, I don't know who, who was first, maybe it was a Microsoft project, I'm not sure. But the entire uh, the entire world, the entire corporate world was like, yes, this this is what we've been looking for. This is this is the this is the what this is what we want. Types for JavaScript. Uh, I'm not inviting you guys to to pounce about on, on TypeScript per se, but like how do we all feel about TypeScript? Not the number four. That is both that test is both dynamic and it's static, but maybe not a little bit. But 
hey, you can give it to junior developers and all the mistakes are gone. I mean, as uh, an old programmer. Because <laughs> types. Because types. <laughs> types. <laughs> As an Elm programmer, I don't care. Like, I've already got the better thing. Why would I downgrade the TypeScript? <laughs> TypeScript has, has some limitations, right? I mean, I would say if I was doing a Greenfield project and my choices were TypeScript and, uh, um, and JavaScript, I would choose TypeScript as they say seven days a week and twice on Sunday. I mean, it, it's clearly superior to JavaScript, uh, wh whichever version you choose in every, every possible way, but it's not rigorous, right? I mean, there's, there's a lot of like, I think one of the ways that you can measure the rigor of, of a type checker is just how many runtime errors you're getting. And you can get all kinds of standard JavaScript runtime errors in a TypeScript program just because of what the limitations of the, the type checker are versus you look at something like, like Elm and, and it is, it is, feasible to, to write Elm programs that literally have zero runtime errors, which is, uh, it's, it's a That's different kind of world. Of, um, <laughs> yeah, and, and it's the same thing when you hear the closure people talk about like the success they have with attaching REPLs to production and being able to like, you know, turn turn things on and off, uh, you know, dynamically. It's the same sort of thing. You, you, you achieve certain capabilities uh, with, with the environment that you work in um, and they are uh, kind of earth shattering. They, they really have a huge impact on how you work from that point forward to the rest of your life. But, but having no runtime errors or having runtime errors limited to things like, oh, well, you know, the HTTP server served half, half my, my response and then, then cut the connection. Um, if that's the only thing you have to worry about, it really changes how you approach things. Yeah, I think, uh, I think type, TypeScript is definitely you know, a step up from uh, JavaScript, but I would tend to agree with Richard that I think Elm had it solved. And uh, I, it, I, just, I just feel like Elm is slightly, not, not slightly, but probably even more simpler, right? So I think in closure world, we like go about simple versus easy. And uh, I think Elm is uh, like, uh, this, I think, I think Elm has this um, uh, feeling of uh, what Go programmers, you know, which we didn't talk about, but you, you know, the, the Go programmers, they live and die by, by Go language. There's a lot of problems in that language, right? You know, how to manipulate data. We, we have generics uh, for 55 years after. So it's like, there's a lot of problems in Go, but people love Go and people who were uh, DevOpsy, right? They just wrote shell script and maybe a little Python. They became like huge Go programmers, they wrote HashiCorp and now it's public company. So it's just, uh, just the simplicity of Elm, I think is, uh, is uh, I, would, I would, I'd like if, if I, if I, if I know that uh, Richard, you have a choice with Java and Clojure, you, you, by, the way, by the way, you picked correctly, but if I had the choice between type, you know, TypeScript and Elm, I would pick Elm just because it's just, it's just simpler, right? So I, yeah. and uh, I understand why you're saying that I want to look at the, uh, you know, zoom out and always look at the page. Uh, the, the context here, the missing context here is that if you look at the page in other languages, it's going to be five pages. So you cannot look at five pages at the same time. In Elm, in, in Elm you can. And uh, before, you know, before we uh, move to the next topic, I just want to, uh, if, if we don't have any more time, we didn't talk about something really important that people usually bring in saying it's, it's performance, right? So people usually say that uh, uh, it's, uh, you know, it's orthogonal to everything. So one thing that, uh, you know, the reason, you know, people claim that dynamic Correctly claim that dynamically typed languages are slower on on you know on average than than static type languages because of the you know runtime polymorphic dispatch right so you you have uh, somebody's calling a function you have to or somebody gives you data you don't know what the data what the data type is so you have to kind of dispatch it figure out if it's, if it's this type or you have to go to this virtual table like from C plus plus days and figure out what that function in the virtual table where does it live and stuff like that so uh, some dynamic languages. Such as closure, you know the way it's solved uh, from I think one point eight. Uh, there is something that's called direct linking. When it was introduced, so you can compile your program saying yes, I'd like to, as Martin pointed out, to hook it to, to, to hook into my program using REPL to change it at runtime or whatever, and then I'll I'll just compile it by default, and I'm okay with the you know with the performance hit, which is very very little to be honest but but i'm okay with it right so uh at other times for example you build something super mission critical and you need this like a super 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 fast program right so um but super fast is very questionable of course as, as well but if you need it slightly faster you can actually compile it with something called direct link and then all these objects will be statically compiled and direct link before before they uh before the artifact is produced so you have the kind of uh, benefits of both worlds so the, then in other languages solve it solve it differently but for performance i think if we want to talk about performance a little bit i think it's very important because um, I, I actually had a very 
interesting uh, you know, re revelation when I, I used Scala professionally for a couple of years, three years, and uh, we were, I was working on like doing something high frequency trading thing, but it needs to be super fast and like millions a second. And uh, of course we use Akka, which is, uh, you know, the repo from OTP Erlang. Uh, but uh, the problem, you know, the problem is that the, those mailboxes fill up fast and they, and the, there's like a single threaded and it's not so super cool. So we figured out that, uh, uh, the, my, my point is that usually performance problems have nothing to do with static versus dynamic typing. Usually they have to do with the architecture or libraries that we use or, you know, the, the approach that we take to solve certain problems. Uh, the, uh, you know, the virtual machines that, that it's running on, right? Uh, so that's uh, just, I, don't, I just want to touch on the performance. I know that the question was about TypeScript, but I think performance is super important uh, kind of like vertical in static versus dynamic typing. Oh, yeah. I have a question about immutability. How, when I say mutability, I mean, uh, I don't mean uh, final, that data cannot change. I mean, also the ability to create new version of data. So let's say again, I have a record with four fields and I want to change a single field. So I want to create a new version of the record when only one field has changed. So in closure, we have uh, represented as a map and we have a, a a very efficient function that creates a new a new version of the map uh, with the change where the fields that are not changed are shared. So there is no performance hit in terms of computation and in terms of memory. Right. Is there is there something like that out of the shelf? In stat, I mean, in what statically type language do we have something like that? You're talking about persistent hash tries. Yes, that's the way it's implemented in Clojure, but do we have something yeah. similar uh, in static? I mean, I know like Haskell and Elm have the exact same mechanism where you there's, there's a, a construct where you basically copy an object and overwrite specific fields as you do it. I know Scala, when you do case classes in Scala, uh, machine generates a copy method, which has exactly the same properties where it will return a new, new copy of the object you invoke it on um, and allow you to override does, any uh, number of the, the fields it has. But yeah, but it does a clone, but, right? So it's not efficient. So uh, in, in Elm standard library, there's a data structure called dict, so short for dictionary. And I believe it's a hash array map try under the hood. And so yeah, yeah but you replace I mean, one, yeah. yeah, yeah, I know. But I mean, if you represent your data as a static type, not as a dict, is there a way to-, to Oh, I see, as a record. Um, yeah. Yes, yes. Yeah. I, I so in Elm, we talked about doing that, but the- the feeling was, and I think this is correct, is that that would be a performance pessimization, not an optimization. Like it would make the performance worse if we did that because the amount of overhead associated with having like an entire uh, dictionary data structure for compared to like a record with like five fields. I mean, it's really rare to have a record that has like more than half a dozen fields in it. Um, it, it would just end up being like worse performance even though you're able to do node sharing. It's better to just clone it all the time. Um, I'm curious because in, in closure, it's it it feels so. Let's say you want immutability, right? Mm -hmm. In closure, it feels like it's impossible to have immutability without this feature. So I'm curious why this need is not uh, perceived as important in other languages. So in Elm, you 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 can't mutate records, or you can't mutate anything uh, in place. Like you have a record, and you can say the syntax was saying like, give me this record that I've got. I want to make a, a clone of it that's the same record except I've changed this one field. So you can do that. So semantically, it's immutable. The question is just under the hood: is it a hash map or a, you know a dictionary of some sort, or is it just like a flat you know like bytes in memory? Um, and that's it. And it's the latter because we expect that the way that people use records in practice, that's going to be way faster. So it's just a. It's just but a you don't care. I mean, the performance hit is it's not significant. Well, the thing is, the, the, the concern is that it would be a performance hit to do it the other way. <laughs> like the node, the node sharing would, would be the overhead of the node sharing would not pay for itself, but it, it would be actually like more than just. And even if you have a nested data structure, I mean, let's say you have yeah. a. Con mm -hmm. So you think that yeah, if so you if it, what you're oh, saying is that if you represent a nested data structure as a record without the overhead of the of the map of the map up try hash map tries, it's faster to clone a flat data structure than to do the 
the smart trick that the hash map tries do? Uh, so you don't have to do a like deep clone because because everything's semantically immutable. Like if you have let's say like a, a record with another record with another record inside of it, if you clone the root record, you don't need to clone all the intermediate ones mm, because I nobody's see. allowed to mutate those anyway. Yeah. Um, yes, I, but if you yeah if, if you change some leaf in a deep deeply nested structure, you'll be cloning a lot of stuff. Like you have to got clone all the way up to yeah, but not only through the path, not everything. Correct. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So I mean, some, like of it, the, some of it's circumstantial the, for, for, yeah, for how like much you care about that. Like, like, yeah. yeah, yeah. I think like there's some class of people where, where their 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 performance problems are really they exist only in the database, right? It's like they're they're going to execute a query, they're going to post process the results. Um, they're not going to care about the performance of of cloning some number of options of, of objects as they're uh, processing them. Um, so I think it just depends on on the category where you're in, and, and if, if you're when you're dealing with big numbers, I think that the big numbers can sometimes dominate your tool choice and your language choice. Um, but in a lot of cases, like, I mean, not everyone's building Twitter, or Facebook and stuff like that, where um, they can choose based on, you know, either the, the, the talents of their existing team or, or some other um, you know, developer ergonomic thing based on their opinions versus having like a, a strictly empirical uh, measure like that. And Richard, what, in terms of the, the syntax, what, languages support this kind of update? Because I know Java don't, does not. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I know Elm does, um, Rock does, uh, and those are the only two that I know of. Um, Haskell, does Haskell? I, I don't know of, uh, I don't know how Haskell's works under the hood. Um, yeah, I don't know either. So I, mean, I know in, in, in Haskell, like there, there are no data structures. I like, guess everything's just like a tuple. And so when you have like a data type in Haskell, it's like you're aliasing the, the elements of a tuple. And so they really only have one thing, but I don't know the answer to your question in that context. I mean, Haskell does have records. I just don't know what their runtime representation is. Um, worth noting that in Rock, I guess I'm obliged to bring this up. Um, we do it a way that I don't know of any other language doing it, which is that it's semantically immutable, but actually at runtime, uh, we detect when it's safe to do in-place mutation and we don't clone at all. We just, we're just like, oh, well, nobody else has a reference to this thing. So nobody's gonna notice if we just mutate it in place and just give you the same one. Wow, nice. There aren't any big enough rock programs to know like how well this works at scale yet, but um, it, it works. <laughs> you know that in Clojure also sometimes we do that. Like STM, right? No, not STM. Some, sometimes some Clojure core functions, they use non-persistent data structures hmm. because no, you don't care. Uh, it's an internal uh, data yeah. structure that... But that's it's deterministic, not, though. What 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 yes. Richard's talking is not deterministic. So it's it's at runtime. We decide whether to use transient data structures or not. And closure, what you what you're talking about, we do we do have a capability to drop down to transient. We do have a capability to say now open it up. It's transient now. You know, do the real mutation and and then now go 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 back to it. I mean, it's it's rarely used, but it's there. But I think Richard is talking about runtime you know, decision making. So it's it's pretty cool. I think that the, what we all talking yeah. about is tree and. Uh, something so that's coined the term of persistent data structure. And I think the interesting, uh, the interesting uh, kind of side effect of that, as we all know, uh, is a React JS virtual DOM. And I think Elm is very much into the you know, virtual DOM party, but is the comparing what changed, right? So if we mutate, DOM is, is inherently a tree, right? So if we, if we change something in a DOM, like React JS actually uh, copied, I think the persistent data structure idea uh, from from Clojure script and they the, their checks the, their checks uh, became super super quick right because you only need to uh, compare the root references rather than if they change that means the whole tree has changed rather than compared to do the deep comparison and I believe Martin uh, you 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 know a lot more than than me on on that topic but I believe the Scala immutable data structures are all persistent data structures so you don't actually do the clone yeah. you actually <laughs> do the same thing that Clojure does in terms of uh, you know changing the the path from the root. That, that, that's right. And one of the one of the features that Scala has, so Scala has like mutable extensions. Um, it's not nearly as elegant as what Richard's doing with, with Rock or what you were describing. It's not automatic, it's manually invoked. But the, the thought process is basically, look, if I have some data structure and it's just on my stack frame, right? And so there's no concurrent access. I, I know exactly, this thing's only going to exist until I return out of the function I'm in. They encourage you to use the mutable structure specifically because they perform better. And they're like, they, that's not the time to put on your, you know, to get in the ivory tower and try to, you know, churn through all these, these generative iterations of immutable structures. Just use a mutable map 
do the work you're going to do, and then you can convert it to an immutable version when you return it back out. So, I mean, this was, of course, that, that, that concept, this is uh, what, 10 to 15 years um, in, in use. So the, the, the technology really wasn't advanced enough then to, to make these decisions automatically. And this is part of why I think Richard got interested in the, the, the Rock project to, uh, to be able to explore exactly that, that yeah, style the, of okay. memory utilization. Let me say something that I think uh, is interesting and it does, it will break the ripple, by the way, what, what Richard mentioned. Because even if I have a piece of data that is inner to my function and that is touched only by me, there could be a problem with a REPL scenario. What we do in closure, we will plug a REPL and we will capture the scope. We will capture this piece of data so that we can replay the scenario later. And in that case, if you allow mutation, it won't break the regular code, but it will break my capability to do experiments. Oh, and you cannot uh, anticipate that. You cannot anticipate this scenario because it's uh, uh, totally ad hoc. Uh, well, we, we can. So, so um, rock is reference counted, and and so the term that we use for this is opportunistic in place mutation. And so, um, every time you know you're like passing something around, it's like reference count goes up, it goes down, et cetera, et cetera. And we only do the in place mutation if the reference count is exactly one, right at the time you're trying to mm. do the thing. So, if you say like, for example, I have like a list, and I want to up, you know, replace the third element of the list uh, with like something else. What that operation does is first it looks and sees what's the reference count of this list. If it's one right now, great, we can just do it in, new, in place. Mm -hmm. I know nobody else is using it. If not, I have to clone it and make a new list and then replace, you know. So it could be that the same function, if it is slightly modified because I have connected my REPL and added a, a scope capture, mm -hmm. it will behave differently. The runtime will... Uh, no, it's just, so semantically, like the the list like set operation is the basically it's like I'm going to call this, I'm going to give it a list, I'm going to give it an index, and then a value to put in that index, and then I'm going to return back a new list. So when I'm making my program, I don't have any way to know whether or not it was mutated. I'm just like I don't know. It gives me back a new list. Either it's a fresh list or it's one the old one recycled and mutated in place. I have no idea. So my code doesn't change. It's just like the performance may be different depending on, you know, whether or not it's able to do that optimization. So- But do you, do you need to lock it then? Sorry to interrupt. If you if you check the reference and as you adding, you know, an element, you could, the, the second reference can pop up. Do you need to compare and set? I mean, how, how do you- Yeah, right. So um, if it can be in a concurrent environment without getting into too many details, there's like atomic reference counting versus not. And so like, if you have atomic reference counting, you don't have to worry about that. Well, you do- But, you but do, atomic reference counting takes a little bit longer. It, you do incur it's also hard to get that second uh, reference unexpectedly. Like if you only have one reference and the code path is executing, it's the only code path that could add the second reference. Uh, yeah, so, so like an atomic yeah. reference count is, is basically just, it's like a, what is it, compare and swap or compare and increment. Like, there's like, there's like one yes. of instruction, it just takes a little bit longer than the one that doesn't do that. So you don't have to set up a whole mutex or anything. Like, my, my, my point is that your, your optimization of making it mutable also incurs the cost of locking it. Right. So there's like, uh, there, there, there's, there's also, I mean, it's, it's a very slight cost because comparing swap is super fast. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but, but what I'm saying is that uh, we, we're making it mutable so it's faster, but, but even if we just need to add a single element or a single bit, I think the locking kind of, uh, I think we, we probably should think of how large is that mutation is, do we need to make it mutable, right? Or do we need to have the locking or, or not? So, so one thing that we want to do in the future um, is uh, do escape analysis and figure out like basically could this possibly be used by like in a multi-threaded scenario? And if the answer is no, like if it's if it doesn't if it's just like internal to a function, for example, it's like well just don't do the atomic one because there's no chance that anybody else could possibly be messing with it. Um, we don't do escape analysis yet though, but like that's on our radar. I, I, All right. I, 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 I got to uh, jump in. We only have five minutes left. So I want to, I want to, uh, this is a spirited discussion, but I want to move on yeah. from, you know, the, the fascinating and the, you know, reference count thing, because it does sound awesome. We have a, an interesting question from our former colleague, Matthew Gilbride. Uh, he, he just tangentially, he wanted to talk about macros and macros and metaprogramming. And in his experience with Scala, he always found that he himself frustrated when he encountered a library that used macros without what he thought was a good reason. And he had that uh, recently actually had that experience with Rust. Uh, so how do we feel about like macros uh, as they come 
they're I guess they're more prevalent with dynamic languages than they are with the static ones. I, mean, I would just I'll, I'll I'll just say quickly. Uh, there are certain problems where dynamic languages have a huge advantage, and this is one of them. Um, <laughs> so if, if you're interested in macros, I think you're much better off in in the the, the dynamic languages. Um, there's a, there's another good example when you're dealing with immutable structures is like like cursors in dynamic languages are super super simple, and like the equivalent in, in statically typed lenses and things like them are just so syntactically inconvenient to construct as a as an alternative. So uh, so yeah, so um, if if you really like macros, I would lean towards the dynamic languages. I'm sure I'm sure uh, you two have a lot more to say about it. Actually, uh, what I would say probably would be different but what, what you would think I would say uh, because uh, I dislike macros uh, I do have you know there's very very little in the in the search space of programs that we create where macros make sense to, to me personally when they when there, there are such you know opportunities to, to to use them and when they fit there's nothing better than them right but uh, like creating you know new construct for people to reuse for something macros is uh i would say it's a blessing and a curse and i think uh, the curse part is like 90 percent uh the reason for that is especially for especially in 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 languages that compose things macros are do not compose right so you if you create a function uh, and then a function and a function and a function, you can compose of those four functions if you create you know a function and a macro and a function you cannot say you know, thread this value from the function to the macro to the function because that that macro is not taking you know at run, run, runtime things; it's already compiled, right? So, so that this is this is a curse of, of, of macros. But also, if you ever played with macro expansion, especially on the uh, uh, on the kind of language level, and I think uh, you know if we've, if we've looked at the language level, obviously Richard did, then it's it's not a fun thing to look at. Uh, we have uh, in closure, I would say specifically, we do have. Uh, there was a big craze, uh, and you, we all know about it. It's called the uh, Go Go channels in in Go or Green Thread in Python. So Closure kind of, I forgot which year was it, uh, some year. Uh, Closure kind of inherited the the Go routines, and we called Go channels, right? So we created this thing in Closure. It's a library. Uh, things got it's not a core part part core language, but uh, there's a Go channel uh, that you can basically, you know, you, you pass your uh, executable code to Go channel. Of course, you don't block in a Go channel. The problem, the couple problems, right? First, Go actually implemented it correctly in terms of like they have a very complex scheduler that, uh, you know, that offloads the IO threads to operating system for real threads. You know, you can block there. It's fine. You know, it's gonna it's gonna just uh, part the, part the, the execution correctly and give it give it up to operating system thread, but uh, the, the, the worst part of this is not even that, it's that if you look at the Go, Go is a macro, but that macro is uh, the whole world, the whole universe inside that macro, right? And if you want to know the, the whole state machine and everything, I'm not saying that, uh, you know, there's a better way to implement it, I don't know, but I'm, I'm just saying that this is one of the, one of my examples of why I, you know, if I need Go channels, uh, probably would uh, go to Go or C Sharp, I think, or, you know, I would not use the macro just because uh, every time you need to debug it, it's just, and again, this is me speaking against like the closure community won't, won't like me for this, but I'm used to this. So, uh, <laughs> but what I'm saying is that macro uh, is super Actually, you're, It uh, reminds super me fun, the true but, uh, of macro. One, one sec, one sec. Yes, I would say that macro is, is super fun, is super useful when you, you know, maybe in, in REPL time or when you prototype in something, or maybe this you know, super, super unique cases where you need a macro, but I wouldn't say, I wouldn't agree with you, Martin, say dynamic languages have a huge, you know, advantage of static type language. I would say it, they have a huge hole that you can fill with macros, which we shouldn't. And sometimes you should and can, but I don't think that's, that would be, that's my, that's my personal opinion. I don't think we should uh, kind of say, hey, macros, you know. That's I think not, that's uh, not. we, I think at least in the closure community, we, most of us would agree with you. And we have these three rules of macros. Rule number one, don't write macros. Rule number two, don't write macros. Rule number three, don't write macros. <laughs> yeah, but All then right. that, well, we that have is to... real world, but there's a lot of macros. So, so there's uh, like... we, you know, I can't believe it, but we talked for a whole hour already, and we are actually out of time. Uh, so... Um, Thank you all for coming to the panel. This was a great discussion. We, we had some controlled chaos. I was a little nervous before uh, we started, but I'm very glad we did this.
Um, thank you all for participating. Thank you to all of our panelists.